my name is Edward, as mentioned, and this is what I'm going to do today. And as you see, I'm going to start, uh, start to talk about what I call uh, the game changer. And this is one of the biggest innovations for humankind over the last couple of hundred years. And it's not, believe it or not, one of BioXRAX technologies, but it is fossil-based plastics. Uh, and the reason why I call it the game changer is that when fossil-based plastics kind of entered into the scene around the middle of the last century, it changed everything. And it did this because it's a cheap material, it's a versatile material, and it's a highly functional material. And if you look around in society, maybe not in this particular room here, but if you look around in society, you see plastics everywhere. And it's the basis of most of the the, or some of the most important industries that we, uh, that we uh, de depend on as human beings today, such as the healthcare sector, such as the food sectors, and such as the IT sector. But as most people know, the fossil-based plastics, they come with a lot of issues. And uh, this is obvious to, to some, if not uh, most, people, but to understand how to solve the problem and to understand how bioextracts comes in, it's important to kind of dig into what these issues really are. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on the issues of fossil-based plastics before I go on and talk about the solutions and where bioextracts fits in. And the issues around uh, fossil-based plastics comes in four categories. And the first such category is pollution. And uh, every year in the world, around 350 million tons of plastic waste is generated on a global basis. Around 8 million tons of these 350 million tons end up in the ocean. This has a lot of consequences. One of the more visual consequences is what is called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which basically is a big floating island of plastics located between Hawaii and the Californian coast. And this is roughly three times the size of the country France, or twice the size of the state of Texas, if you prefer that reference. So it is huge. So that's the first issue around fossil-based plastics. The second issue of fossil-based plastics is greenhouse gas emissions, and I like to make the comparison between uh, with the aviation industry, which represents roughly 2% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The plastic industry represents twice that, at around 4%, and this is a share that is increasing year by year. So that's the second big issue around fossil-based plastic. The third big, big issue around fossil-based plastic is micro Plastic. Of course, this is a subcategory, if you so will, of, uh, of pollution uh, in general, but it has some very specific characteristics, and why, that's why I define it as its own issue. And these are micrometer scale or even nanometer scaled plastic particles that ends up in, in, uh, in nature, it enters into the food chain, and so on. And there are more and more reports coming showing its links to number of uh, health concerns for human beings, such as the link to the decreased fertility, such as links to Parkinson's disease, and so on. So that's the third big issue around fossil-based plastics. And then we have the fourth big issue, and that's a reinforcer of the other three issues. And that is the fact that we are using more and more plastics. So despite the really bad press that pl fossil-based plastics are getting, the production and consumption is continuing to increase. In fact, it's set to double uh, over the coming 35 years. So those are the four big issues of fossil-based plastics. Now, the good news is that both consumers and legislators, they are seeing the problem, and this has consequences. And the most important consequence for us as a company is legislation. And I would like to talk a bit about some of the pieces of legislation that has come over the last couple of years. So the first one that I'd like to mention is the EU ban on intentionally added microplastics. So this is basically an EU-wide ban on non-biodegradable microplastics that are added in a wide range of products. So this includes detergents, various personal care products such as cosmetics, such as uh, sunscreen. It includes football pitches as well. 
The second piece of legislation that I would like to mention is the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, or the IRA. Of course, this is a very wide legislation that doesn't only uh, handle uh, plastics, but it includes a lot of financial incentives for investments in bioplastics production capacity, including uh, for the kind of plastic that we uh, produce. And then we also have the White House communicated aim to replace 90% of all fossil-based plastics by 2040 uh, with biodegradable, or sorry, bio-based alternatives. And then there are a wide range of different carbon taxes and carbon credits. They work in different ways, they have different mechanisms, but what they have in common is that they increase the cost of either producing or using fossil-based plastics because fossil-based plastics contribute to CO2 emissions. And then the last one that I would like to mention is the EU's Green Claims Initiative, which, to put it very briefly and simply, is a ban on greenwashing. So if you are a company who is either using or producing plastics, you are up against a very big challenge. Now, a good piece of news is that there is a solution, and that solution is PHA, or polyhydroxyalkanoates. This is a group of polymer, it's not one specific polymer, it's a group of polymer, and what these polymers have in common is that they are bio-based, so they are produced 100% without any fossil involvement. They are biodegradable, so if they end up in nature or in the compost, in the soil, in marine environments, they degrade without leaving any traces, including not leaving any microplastics. And maybe most importantly, they are functional. As a matter of fact, PHAs can, from a functionality perspective, replace the majority of all plastics that we are in use today. Um, PHA is a true circular product. And these characteristics of PHAs is the reason why most of observers believe that PHA is the type of bioplastics with the best growth trajectory over the coming years. And I would like to share one interesting piece of statistics with you. And when you look at this slide, you can see too that maybe I need to move for everyone in the room to see if you can see here on the the left data from the 2021 European Bioplastic Association report, which was published, uh, published in 2022. And to the right, you can see data from the 2022 European Bioplastic Association report, which was published in 2023. So this is the most recent report we have. And what you can see here is that the slightly more darker green, that is projections for 2026 and 2027, respectively, for future production of bioplastic in general, whereas the slightly more light green uh, uh, data is production, projected production capacities for PHAs. And while the, the projections for bioplastics in general was down, uh, revised downwards by 17% between these two reports as a consequence of a bleaker outlook on the global economy, the outlook for PHA was increased by 15% between these two reports. Um, so the projection is that by 2027, around 561,000 tons or around 561 million kilograms of PHA would be produced. That is a big number, but in the world of plastics, it's a very small number. It's almost nothing in the world of, of plastics in general. So why, you might wonder, if we have a material that is bio-based, biodegradable, and can replace the majority of all plastics that are in circulation, why? do we only expect that 561,000 tons will be produced? And in order to explain that, I need to go back uh, a bit and explain how PHAs in general are produced. Um, and this, this is a circle, as you can see, so you can choose wherever you want to start, and I don't think I can point, but if you start from the top of this slide, you can see this renewable triangle, this is a renewable raw material, basically any kind of organic or carbon-rich material. And what you do is that you grow bacteria on this carbon source and then you force the bacteria to start producing PHA and the bacteria, they store the PHA inside the cells. 
They do that as a form of energy and carbon storage for the future, conceptually the same way as humans store fat. So you need a way to get the PHA out of the, the granules, or sorry, out of the bacteria. Once you have done that, you have the PHA granules, you can convert that into a product, such as into a a uh, packaging product, which we have here. Afterwards, you can either recycle or you can compost it, and then it goes back into the circle. But the problem is this extraction step. So using conventional methods to produce PHA, you use a lot of chemicals and a lot of energy for this extraction step. And that kills both the financial argument for PHA because it becomes very expensive and it kills the sustainability argument for PHA because it, you use a lot of chemicals and you use a lot of energy in the production process. And this is where bioextracts comes in. As we have developed a method where we use bacteria for this extraction step. This is a patented method and instead of using uh, uh, chemicals to remove or release the PHA granules from the bacteria cells, we use a second bacteria which releases enzymes which carries out the extraction. This is a very cheap process because it uses no consumables such as chemicals and very little energy and it's a very environmentally friendly method again because we use zero chemicals and very little energy. But at Bioextracts, we're not only working with bioplastics and PHAs. We're also working with something from a, a business perspective, completely def different from a technical perspective, very similar. And that is feathers. So we're working with poultry feathers from chickens and turkeys. Around 5 million tons of feathers are produced on a global basis every year. Most of it is being wasted. What we do instead is that we have de developed two different processes that can either turn it into keratin microfibers, which can be used as reinforcements in different kinds of material applications, or we can turn it into a protein hydrolysate, which we can use as a protein ingredient into feed. Now, we are a small company. We have rough, or not roughly, we have exactly 14 uh, employees, and we are working on gigantic markets such as the plastic industry and the animal feed industry. So, we can't do it ourselves. So, we have made the decision not to be producers ourselves. So, we're an out licensing company. And in order to be that, we need to work with partners. And in our quarterly reports, we have a fairly detailed an uh, overview of the different customer projects that we are working with. I'm not going to go through every, uh, all of them today, but I would like to mention at least two. I would like to mention the JDA that we signed a few weeks ago with one of the world's three largest candy producers, and that is to use PHA as a biodegradable ingredient in chewing gum. The second one is an MOU we signed with Chematur Engineering, which is a large Swedish engineering company. This was also a few weeks back, and the idea behind that project is that they will be our global exclusive partners for one of the types of PHAs that we can produce with our technology. Remember, it's not one specific polymer, it's a group of polymers. And then lastly, team and facilities. Um, here, are, here is our uh, management team, which includes myself. I have a background mainly as a lawyer and management consultant before I joined uh, Bioextracts uh, seven years ago. We have Mohammed Ibrahim, who is our CTO. He has spent the last 20 years or so uh, doing research within bioplastics. We have Klaus Ingstorp, who is our C. OO, he has a background of roughly 25 years from Perstorp, uh, specialty chemicals, where he was, for instance, site and plant manager and also respons responsible for the global engineering group. And then we have Mats Persson, who some might remember from the previous uh, presentation, is the chairman of both Circum and Bioextracts. And he has a background primarily from the Perstorp group as well, where he was at several positions, including as deputy CEO. And then lastly, uh, our facilities. This is an upscaling facility that we invested in during last uh, year. Uh, but as I mentioned, we're not a producing company, we're an out-licensing company. So the purpose of this facility is to demonstrate our technology, thereby accelerating our license sales. And then, of course, it's an added benefit that it can be used to supply samples for our various uh, evaluation and commercialization 
projects. And that is everything I had for you today. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, thank you for that, and uh, we have a couple of minutes before we uh, get our next speakers mixed up, wherever they now are. Uh, so I will just uh, start by asking you uh, uh, the rationale be be behind the rights issue, as your capital requirements are quite low. What what's the thinking there? Yes, yeah, so I, I didn't mention that we're, we're currently, or in, in a week or two, we're starting a rights issue, where we bring in... Uh, uh, around 9 million uh, Swedish kroner. It's guaranteed up to, I think, 86% by top-down uh, guarantee. The rationale for that is that even if our capital requirement, as you say, is fairly low, we're not making any investments in equipment or anything like that, we have quite a lot of cost uh, to finance the current projects that we have as for instance this JDA that we signed with this candy producer for instance that require quite a lot of production for us even if it's by uh, to a certain extent covered uh, by uh, by by the candy uh, candy producer and also if we look at MOU with Chemateur what they are doing is that they're starting selling our technology based on this contract now and of course it will take some time before that you know, start generating uh, proper cash. So the idea is that this rights issue will bring us up until uh, being a cash flow positive company. Interesting. We thank you for that. And I'm sure you will be preparing questions in the next uh, intermission here. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you.